Good morning. And welcome. So good to see everybody this morning. Glad that you've come to worship with us. And especially if you're a first time guest, we're glad to have you with us today to worship. Uh, a couple of announcements, uh, kind of a brief welcome this morning. Just two announcements. One is, is today's the last day for our deacon nominations. The uh, box is right through this door here on the right. Uh, so make sure that you've got somebody that you think would, would serve as a, a deacon. Uh, that you put their name in that box. Today is the deadline for that. The other thing is our church council has begun working on our positions for the new church year that begins September the 1st. So be in prayer for what God would have you to do uh, as our, our church council members come around and, and ask you to serve, uh, either continue in your current positions or if you've got uh, something that God has laid on your heart that you'd like to be a part of, let one of us know. Any of the... the, the uh, church staff or uh, you can call the church office and let them know uh, let Deb know during the during the week but uh, we're glad that you're here and this time I'm going to call on our deacon of the week brother Keith to lead us to the Lord in prayer Don't forget to come forward and, uh, and place your uh, offerings into the plates during these songs. Thank you. I know a place where we can go to lay your troubles down in your soul. I know a place where mercy flows. Take the stains, make it wider than snow. Like a tide, it is rising up deep inside the current that moves and makes it come alive. Living water that brings the dead to life. Oh, oh, oh. we're going down to the river, down to the river, down to the river to pray. Let's get washed by the water, washed by the water, we we'll rise up in amazing. Let's go down, down, down to the river. Will we change? Let's go down, down, down to the river. Never the same. I've seen a move in my own life. Take me from dusty roads into paradise. All of my dirt, all of my shame Drown the streams that have made me born again Like a tide, it is rising up Deep inside a current that moves And makes it come alive Living water that brings it into life oh, oh, oh. We're going down to the river Down to the river Down to the river to pray Washed by the water, we we'll rise up in amazing grace. Let's go down, down, down to the river. Let's go down, down, down to the river. Let's go down, we're going down to the river, down to the river, down to the river to pray. Let's get washed by the water, washed by the water, we we'll rise up in amazing grace. Let's go down, down, down to the river. Let's go down, down, down to the river. Amazing grace, down, down, down to the river. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go down in amazing grace. 
amazing grace. I found myself 
myself After searching all these years And the man that I saw He wasn't at all who I thought he'd be I was lost when you found me here I was broken beyond repair Then you came along You sang your song over me It feels like I'm born again
Cause you're not alone Here and now You can be honest I won't try to promise That someday it all works out Cause this is the valley And even now he is breathing on your dry bones And there will be dancing And there will be beauty Where beauty was ash and stone This much I know Oh my soul You are not alone where fear has to face the God you know. One more day, He will make a way. Let Him show you how you can lay this down. I'm not strong enough, I can't take anymore. I was driving to church this morning and saw a little fender bender and it reminded me of a story a story that sometimes even though we're trying to teach the right, right lessons that doesn't always come across the right way it was a mom and her little boy riding down the road one day and she was taking him to McDonald's and he was so excited but she'd also throughout his life been teaching him when they saw a car accident to always pray that somebody might be hurt so as they were approaching McDonald's, she noticed there had been a little fender bender in traffic. And she said to her son, hey, buddy, look over there. There's been a car wreck. I think you need to pray. And he said, all right, Mommy. So he bowed his head, and he said, dear Lord, please don't let those cars block the entrance to McDonald's. This morning, I want to share with you not only an encouraging word, but I hope and pray what will be turn out to be a lot of encouraging words. You know, sometimes we try to encourage somebody. If we're not careful, it can actually come back on us and actually be a discourager for us. So we always have to be on guard, but we always want to look for opportunities to encourage others. There was a particular pastor that worked in a Methodist church and if you're not aware with Methodists and how they do things with their pastors 
every three years you get a new pastor whether you want to or whether you want to change or not that's just how the system works that they rotate them and move them around so every three years it changes and there was one particular minister Methodist minister that was leaving and they were having a little farewell ceremony for him and you know there was some sad faces and stuff and there was one elderly woman who was particularly sad and she just kind of sat over there and cried the whole time and finally he come over and he put his arm around her the pastor just wanted to encourage her a little bit and he said listen honey it's going to be all right it's going to be okay I know that you're sad I'm leaving but listen they're going to send you another pastor and who knows he may be a lot better than I am and she said yeah but that's what they told us last time and it just keeps getting worse <laughs> all right i want to actually give you a little mini message before we get into the main message this morning so you're not going to see the scripture up on the screen and i'm not going to ask you to turn there but in luke chapter 16 or chapter 13 i'm sorry jesus shares a parable about a fig tree and here's what the parable says then Jesus told this story a man planted a fig tree in his garden came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it but he was always disappointed finally he said to his gardener I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig cut it down it's just taking up space in the garden the gardener answered sir give it one more chance leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer if we get figs next year fine if not then you can cut it down so Jesus tells this parable of a fig tree and its inability to produce fruit apparently the owners coming back year after year during harvest time or what should be harvest time expecting to get some figs off his fig tree and he's disappointed each time that he comes there was no figs so obviously we know this story is symbolic of God coming to look for fruit coming to look to receive fruit from his people the Bible tells us that as a child of God we ought to be producing fruit Jesus probably says this story in reference to God's own people Israel whom he had came to give special attention to but they too were not producing the fruit that he saw so what kind of fruit is it that God's looking for out of you and out of me well I assume he looks for the fruit of the spirit that's what the Bible says that that fruit is supposed to be love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control so it's both encouraging as well as troublesome to note that although the gardener in the story sought fruit from the tree he also did give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer I don't know about you but I like receiving special attention from God that sounds well sounds special if you're getting special attention from God that means you're special that's encouraging that he is specifically and specially working on you your circumstances your situation to hear that the master himself will give me special attention in helping me to produce the fruit of the spirit that he wants from me is both comforting and very encouraging and I hope it is for you as well but the troublesome part is what else he gives the tree in order to produce fruit he gave it plenty of fertilizer I often feel that I have plenty of fertilizer in my life and I don't find that all too encouraging after all what do they use for fertilizer in Jesus's day the same thing that they still use in many places today manure poop if you will and I guess it just goes to show that God literally uses poop to bring out the fruit maybe I need to redefine those times when I feel like that I'm surrounded by the poop of life so to speak perhaps I need to recognize that it's specifically in those times that I'm actually receiving that special attention from God himself could it be that God is actually using that poop to refine me and to draw out of my life more fruit see I don't know about you but I have a tendency to reject the poop don't like the smell of it the situation don't like being surrounded by it don't matter if mine yours or animals whatever it is but if it's the poop around me that actually means God giving me special attention and producing lasting fruit 
then maybe I need to understand when life throws some mess at me that it's God's way of paying special attention to me. Maybe that he recognizes in order that to develop lasting fruit, we need to be exposed to a lot of fertilizer. Verse 9 gives us a sober warning. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. I don't know about you, but that's downright scary. God does give special attention. Yes, he does seek my growth and the fruit that I'm to bear. He's merciful. He offers grace. But still, there will come a time when the talking ceases and the judgment comes. Have I experienced lots of fertilizer in my life? Yeah, I have. Maybe you have too. All the more reason it means that you and I ought to be producing more fruit than ever before for the kingdom. Too many times I've heard God's grace emphasized without placing an emphasis on his coming judgment. And while it is by Jesus' grace alone that I am saved, God does not expect that saving faith to come alone. He's looking for the fruit that we're supposed to produce. So today I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to lift your spirits, but I want to encourage you to produce fruit. Take your Bible and stand with me this morning. This is my Bible, the light into my path. I believe it is the indestructible, inexhaustible, infallible Word of God. I am who it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. My mind is alert. My ears are open. My heart is receptive to receive God's Word. Today I will be forever changed. I will never be the same. In Jesus' name, amen. If you haven't already, turn with me in that Bible to Hebrews chapter 10. Just a few verses as our focal verse today, but we are going to look at a few others. Hebrews 10, beginning in verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we look into your word, I pray that each one of us would look into our own hearts and lives. And that, Father, if we need encouraging today, let this be that day. Let your spirit speak to the very depths and the recesses of our heart, Father, and just fill us, remind us of who you are, of who you have called and created us to be, of all that we can be through Christ and the promise that is ours that we truly can do all things through him. Father, let us be encouraged. No matter the circumstances and the things transpiring in our nation at this time, for our hope is not in these things. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is in you, in heaven, in our Lord Jesus Christ, in a new heaven and a new earth and all that you have planned and in store for. But until that time, we pray, Father, for your encouragement today that we would continue to move forward, that we would continue to strive to do your will, and that we would seek to know you better than we ever have before, that that fruit may flow from our lives. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight this day as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I wonder today, are you an encourager are you a discourager? Maybe today you need to be encouraged. You got all these naysayers in your life, so I want to encourage you this morning from some of the words of Dr. Lance Watson. And here's what Dr. Watson says. When you know who you are, then people will want to know who you are. Let me repeat that to you again. When you know who you are, then people will want to know who you are. Do you know who you are this morning? Do you know who you are? Do you know who God says you are? He says you are his prized possession. That's what God says. He says you are his child. 
He says you are a child of the living God. He says you are a saint. He says all these things and so much more. But do you know who you are this morning? Jesus said that you are an ambassador for him. That he has put you and placed you on this earth for such a time as this to be his ambassador. You know what ambassadors do, don't you? We've got a lot of them in our nation that serve our nation going over in other nations. But their job, whatever they do there, is to represent the United States, to represent the will, the intent of the people and the president at that time. That's what our job is. That's who God's called us to be. But the question this morning is, do you know who you are? When you know who you are, then people want to know who you are. You know, it's amazing how God provides. It's amazing to me how God always makes a way where there seems to be no way. We are God's masterpiece. He created us anew in Christ Jesus so that he, we can do the things that he appointed us to do. Paul reminds those at Ephesus that we're not just saved to sit and stare and to soak and sour. We are saved for a reason. There is a purpose to our pilgrimage. There is a point to our praise. There is a reason for our service. God has saved you for something. So wonderful, so awesome, so marvelous, so miraculous that it's hard to believe. You just don't know yet how sweet your life can be, how happy you can be, how high you can rise, how far you can go, how long you can last, how resilient you can be, how courageous you can live, how strong you can feel once you plant yourself in the center of God's will because He has made you into a real piece of work. That's who you are. That's who God says you are. But listen, if we don't believe it, we won't live like it. If we don't believe those things are true, we won't live like it. We'll accept the status quo. Well, I, I guess this is as good as life's going to be. God says he has so much more in mind in the story. He says, I know the plans that I have, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Hebrews 10.25 it's kind of our focal verse, if you will, out of the three verses that we looked at. But I want you to look at it with me this morning. We're going to look at it, actually a couple of translations. The first that we've already saw it in, in New American Standard, which I use. Again, Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Then in the New King James Version, it says, Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. And I really love the New Living Translation as well. Listen to how it describes. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage and warn each other, especially now that the day of his coming back is drawing near. When you look around today, does it make you think that day is drawing near? That God ain't going to put up with this stuff but so much time. Listen, you want some more evidence? You don't have to turn there, but let me tell you real quick some evidence that Timothy gives us that we're in the last days. Here's what he tells you you can look for. And tell me if you recognize this and what you're seeing in our nation. Here's what Paul tells Timothy, but realize this, that in the last days difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revelers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power. See, when I look around, and especially some of the things that's been transpiring in our city streets over the last month or more, I see ungrateful, unholy, malicious, violent, disrespectful, all these things that Paul tells Timothy. 
what's going to be happening in the last days. So we shouldn't be alarmed. We shouldn't even be aware. I want you, in spite of what's happening around us, to still be encouraged. And so the three things I want to encourage you this morning that you, in turn, may encourage each other. Because, listen, you don't think we need some encouragement? Look around this morning. Look around this morning. There's a lot of your brothers and sisters that ought to be sitting in here with you, and they're not. So the first thing that we see here that I believe that Paul was telling us here in the book of Hebrews is that we need to encourage each other as the church to attend church. You need to be in church. You need to be in God's house. And listen, I know what's happened, the shutdowns, all the stuff that's transpired and all, but now that that's been at least lifted where we're able to come back, we need to come back. We need to be in God's house. We need to be together. We need to encourage each other to attend church. William Arthur Ward once said, Flatter me and I may not believe you. Criticize me and I may not like you. Ignore me and I may not forgive you. But encourage me and I may never forget you. After analyzing many surveys, J.C. Stale found that the principal cause of unrest among workers were the following failure to give credit for suggestions failure to correct grievances failure to encourage criticizing employees in front of other people failure to ask employees their opinions failure to inform inform employees of their progress and favoritism you see even the secular world recognizes the power of encouragement did you know that for every single person that you have in your life that encourages you there's going to be three to discourage you I'm telling you for every single person that you have in your life you know that person that you kind of look forward to boy I hope they call me this week or I hope I get to see them I hope because they've always got an encouraging word for me for every one of those you have there's three that's going to discourage you fact a lot of times through our life we hear discouraging voices and here's the kind of words you'll usually hear you can't do that you can't do that that's impossible you're no good can't you do anything right you'll never amount to anything you'll never change why bother what's wrong with you you see, you might hear these things in people's voices. We might see it etched on their faces or in their actions. And if we're not careful, we might actually begin to believe them about ourselves. And you may have heard such things from your family. You may have heard some of the things from your friends, from a teacher, from somebody you respected, somebody you work for, or from the world in general. But listen, you shouldn't ever hear these things coming out of God's people's mouths. You shouldn't hear these kinds of things here at church. We shouldn't hear these things when we come together as the body of Christ. My definition of an encourager is a person who will make you feel better about yourself or about the situation you are in after you talk with them. Listen, I spend a lot of time in my office talking and counseling with various people in the church. And you know, it's a funny thing to me. I, I actually, it's be, kind of become a, a kick or uh, comical to me. But a lot of times when somebody says, Pastor, need to talk, whatever, and I'll say, let's go into my office. And they go, oh. It's almost like we're back in school. You know, when you said you got to go to the office in school, well, that was a bad thing. It's not supposed to be bad here, folks. And guess what else happens to almost 9.8% of the people that walk out of there after we talk? Pastor, I feel so much better. I'm so glad I came and talked. I needed to hear another perspective. I needed to hear more of what God has to say. We need to encourage each other. Listen, if I ever tell you that we need to go into my office and talk, I'm not saying we won't ever have to address some kind of issue or whatever. But it ain't to tear you down. It ain't to criticize you. It ain't to make you feel bad. It is to build you up. It is to encourage you. It is to help you, to give you hope if you've lost it. That's the reason. And I want to get in there one-on-one -on -one just like Jesus did with so many so there are no distractions. So here's what I want you to know more importantly. 
Here's what Jesus wants you to know. You'll never hear those words come out of my mouth. You can't do that. That's impossible. You're no good. Can't you do anything right? Never, ever hear me say any of those things. Here is what I have to say. You can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens you. That's the word I have for you. That's the encouragement that God says if you put your heart and your mind to it and it is something that's going to not only bring you fulfillment but bring Him glory, there is nothing you can't do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Hebrews 10, 10 25 again says, not forsaking our own assembling together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near no matter what mankind has done to church listen i still want you to know god or church is god's idea it is his only way his only method of reaching and saving this world there is no plan b it's the church it's us do you know god has only ever established two institutions in on this earth marriage and the church that's the two institutions that God established on this earth marriage and the church and normally now that we're back in here I don't have to pay attention to those cameras anymore but I want to take just a moment to say this morning for any and all who may be still watching at home still afraid of the virus still uh, uh, possibly the potential of what may happen I want to encourage you to take that first step and to come back, to come back into God's house, to come back into the presence of God's people, to come back to this place of praise and to worship. Because listen, here's what's happened whether you realize it or not. If you haven't been here in a while, you're not as spiritually strong as you were when you were attending. It's inevitable. I don't care who you are and you say, well, pastor, I've been reading my Bible at home and I've been watching you some, that's great. That's fantastic. Please don't stop. But you're not as spiritually strong as you were before this started. I hadn't been able to get in to go to the gym for over six months now. I can tell you standing here this morning, I am not as physically strong as I was six months or 12 months ago. And some of you may say, well, Pastor, you look about the same. See, that's the danger. That's the danger. Pastor, you look about the same. You look like you feel the same. But I'm telling you, I am not as strong. Why? Because I haven't been in that gym. I haven't been in that place where there's resistance there to where I have to fight and struggle a little bit and push on something that's, that's heavy. And because of that, it makes me stronger. That's been absent. And because it has, I'm physically weaker now. The same is just as true for your spiritual life. If you haven't been in God's house, in the presence of God's, people singing God's praise with your own mouth and hearing God's preaching that one might be debatable because of me but you are spiritually weaker than you were and the biggest danger for many of you out there is if you're not careful you won't ever come back you won't ever come back listen I can go back to the gym now I'm seeing cars down there all the time you know how long I've been going back? Three weeks now. I, I'm going back this week. That's what I told my. I'm, I'm going back this week. I, I'm going back this week, but I ain't got back yet. Why? It's hard. It's hard when you stop. It, it's uncomfortable. Now you got to walk in, and all the faces I probably used to know that work there are gone, and there's new faces, and maybe the faces I used to recognize that were there when I was there, they're probably going to be gone. It's new people, so it's a little uncomfortable. You're not sure what the rules are. It, it, you know, all these little things that just keeps it and makes it easy. Well, I'll go back and start next week. But if you're not careful, you won't ever get back. You won't ever get back. Listen, there are churches in this city all across our nation today. They still ain't come back to have the service. There's one right across from my house. I can look out each night through my pine trees and see their steeple and the light shining upon it. 
they've not only not come back and had a service sadly heartbreaking to me their pastor told me about a month ago they don't want to they said pastor we're good and even more heartbreaking was the fact that he seemed okay with it we need to encourage each other to be in church we need to encourage each other when the church comes together because listen I know we say come to church but don't ever forget and lose sight of the fact you are the church when we leave out of here today Faymont don't, don't cease to exist Faymont disperses and goes in multiple directions but I'm talking about when we come together as the body of Christ when we meet to have church as we like to call it we need to encourage each other plan on coming to church to be an encourager look for opportunities when you're coming to church on Sunday morning maybe you didn't study your Sunday school lesson and maybe you feel unprepared let me tell you something that you, God can get you ready for from the drive to your house from right here to the church and even if you live right down Cumberland Road and your drive ain't for two or three minutes God show me or some, lay somebody on my heart this morning that needs to be encouraged be intentional about it. Lord, I want to encourage somebody today. I ain't done what I should have this week. I ain't, I ain't read my word and I hadn't prayed in the last couple of days. But help me go encourage somebody else this morning. Because I am glad I'm getting to go and I'm glad I got the health and strength and the ability to be there. Let me find somebody else that it was a little more struggle for them than me to get there this morning and just give them a word of encouragement. Show me who it is. And he'll do it. I promise. Hebrews 3.13 it says, but encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Now, a couple more versions or uh, translations I want to look at. The New King James. Notice what it says. But exhort one another daily while it is still called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And then the New Living Translation. You must warn each other every day as long as it is still called today so that none of you will be deceived by sin and hardened against God you see that's the, the, the danger of the deception right now for those who haven't been coming in the last couple of months and it's one of the ways Satan always fools you into the thing just like the illustration I used with the gym you know what most of them are saying right now well I hadn't been in three or four months and, and everything's still going okay everything in life still seems to be going pretty good so you know maybe church wasn't that important maybe I don't I, I'll get back at some point have you ever had somebody to encourage you at just the right time just I mean like the perfect moment or you went to the mailbox that day expecting something bad or whatever and somebody had dropped you a card in there at just the right time totally unexpected and the words almost picture perfect for what you needed to hear you know what proverbs 25 11 says like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances listen to that again like apples of gold in settings of silver is a word spoken in right circumstances another translation the actual this was the new century version joshua don't have that up there but the right word spoken at the right time is as beautiful as gold apples in a silver bowl encourage look for people to encourage I'll tell you a true story that has somewhat of a humorous humorous end to it but there was once a man named randy low true story Randy Lowe, that was his last name, L-O, Lowe. And so basically almost from childhood, all of his friends just called him Lowe. They always just called him Lowe. Everybody called him Lowe. Well, maybe in part based on that nickname or whatever, but Lowe ended up after graduating high school and all, that was kind of the, the, the realm of life he seemed to stay on, Lowe. Didn't seem to rise, partying, just you know wasting his money multiple friends tried to share the gospel with him over years and most of the time Lowe didn't want to have nothing to do with it but lo and behold one day Lowe listened and Lowe accepted Jesus 
and Lowe's life was changed his heart was set on fire and for about the next couple of years they said he was like the the number one servant in the church doing everything and all of a sudden one day they started looking around and they noticed they weren't seeing Lowe quite as much at church being quite as involved and so finally one of the men that attended church with him said Lowe what's going on man I noticed you haven't been around and all and he said man can we talk can we just go have lunch one day this week and talk and he said sure so he went had lunch with Lowe he said so tell me what's going on Lowe he said man I, I don't know what's happened but I just I feel like that I, I'm so far from God I, I, I don't feel his presence like I was and I, I don't know if I've done something wrong or he said but I, I, at one time I felt like God was just speaking to me all the time everywhere I turned and he said now it, it feels like I haven't heard him speak in a while and I'm just so discouraged he said I mean almost to the point of I, I'm starting to wonder is it even worth it or, or did what happened to me was it really real his buddy said listen God ain't stopped speaking sometimes God's silent but I want to encourage you I want you to go home just start reading your Bible again. Really pray. And I'm going to be praying too that God will speak directly to you and give you a personal word that you'll know it's Him. So Lo took his advice. He went home that evening, spent a little time in prayer, and he opened up his Bible. The guy had actually suggested, he said, I want to suggest you start reading in the book of Matthew. Started in Matthew, got almost to the end, chapter 28. And then he saw it. Matthew 28, 20. And you know what it said? And Jesus was speaking the words himself. Lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age. Now listen, that's somewhat humorous. Think of it in this perspective, though. To him, Jesus had put that verse in there specifically for him. Not... We think of it, lo, I am with you always. Even He didn't hear it that way. He heard somebody speaking his name. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. Be an encourager. Sometimes all it is is just like that friend, pointing somebody in the right direction, giving them that hope, that reminder. We need to encourage each other to attend church we need to encourage each other when the church comes together and third and finally first thessalonians you don't have to turn there joshua will pull them up on the screen for you but from the new american standard that i use it reads god has not destined us for wrath but for obtaining salvation through our lord jesus christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep talking about past or died we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another, just as you also are doing. The New King James Version said, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. And then finally, the New Living Translation. For God decided to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ not to pour out his anger on us he died for us so that we can live with him forever whether we are dead or alive at the time of his return so encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing you know what it means to edify that means to build somebody up to build up their confidence to tell them, yes, you can. To tell them, I believe in you. To tell them, listen, I believe if you put your mind to it, you can do this. You can accomplish it. God will help you. Encouragement has the power to elevate. It causes people to excel even above their own expectations. So I wonder and I ask again, do you spend more time criticizing than you do complimenting? We need to pay compliments even if nobody's complimenting us. Some people pay compliments and they're waiting on the receipt. But listen, God sees, God hears, and He is pleased when we encourage each other. We need to be reminded that we love each other, we appreciate each other. 
Now, sometimes we try to encourage, but we don't get the response that we had hoped for. There was a passenger that was on an ocean liner during a rough Atlantic crossing. The swells were about 20 feet high. The boat was being tossed everywhere, and he was as sick as he had ever been in his life. And as he leaned over the rail of the boat with his face a certain shade of green, one of the stewards came along and tried to encourage him. He said, Sir, I know it's bad, and I know you probably feel horrible, but listen, don't be discouraged. Here's some good news. Nobody has ever died from seasickness. And the old guy said, Please don't say that. It was the hope of dying that's kept me alive this long. Words of encouragement can mean the difference of life and death. Did you know? Do you know how many people have been on the verge of taking their life? And the telephone rang. And there was somebody unexpected on the other end with a word of encouragement that changed and saved their life. Words, words of encouragement. They hold the power of life and death, of defeat and victory, of failing or continuing to get up and try again. Listen, sometimes it comes through words. At other times, it can come through something as simple as a touch. In 1995, there were two twin girls born, Kyrie and Brill. Both were born prematurely weighing only two pounds each. They were watched over carefully, each in their uh, respective incubators. Kyrie began putting on weight immediately, but Braille struggled. She cried and cried, leaving her gasping and blue-faced. They put blankets on her. The mother held her. The father held her. They tried everything, and nothing they did seemed to help. Finally, a hospital nurse fought against all the rules and policies and put both of the babies together in one incubator. And when they were placed together, the healthier of the two threw her arm over her sister in an endearing embrace. Almost immediately, they said the frantic crying stopped and Braille's normish pinkish color returned. Her heart rate stabilized. Her temperature rose to normal. It's a true story of just the power of touch and encouragement. Hebrews 3.13 says, But encourage each other every day while it is still today. Listen, we may need to be encouraged next week, next month, but I got to tell you there is somebody in your life right now that needs to be encouraged today. Before the sun goes down today, maybe in your family, maybe a friend, maybe a fellow church member or friend that you haven't seen here in a while, help each other. So none of you will become hardened because sin has tricked you. Don't walk out of here today thinking, oh, I wish so-and-so could have heard this sermon. Because the truth is that we all could be better encouragers. Don't harden your heart thinking somebody else needs to do this. When in fact, it needs to start with the people hearing the message today. It needs to start with me and with you. So are you going to be that one person in people's life that's going to encourage them? As soon as you decide to be an intentional encourager, I want to warn you, there is a little warning here that comes along with it. The moment you say, God, I want to be an encourager, I want to start intentionally trying to encourage people. Just let me give you a warning. The discourager is going to come along, and he's going to try and discourage you. Satan is going to do everything he can if you're going to try and encourage other people to discourage you because he knows if he can get you discouraged enough, not only are you not going to be an encourager, you're going to need an encourager. So here's what I suggest to you. When the devil brings up your past, remind him of his future. The next time he tells you about your past and how bad and ugly it is, remind him of his future, that he is a defeated foe and he is one day going to be tossed into a lake of fire where he will burn and suffer forever. The man who is fully surrendered to the Lord will never, never deliberately surrender to the enemy. When adversity is most ready to strike us, God is most ready to strengthen us. The devil is an equal opportunity employer. Every person that works for him will go to hell. The Lord adds and multiplies. Satan divides and subtracts. 
Don't permit Satan to remind you of what God has already forgotten. Did you hear that? Don't let Satan remind you of what God has already forgotten. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. And there are two big lies that Satan has been perpetuating ever since the Garden of Eden. Two. Ever since the Garden, these are his two main lies that he shares and tells to mankind. And here they are. You want to hear them? The first one is God is mean, vindictive. He's a spoil sport whose main role in life is to keep us from being fulfilled and happy. When we step out of bounds, he takes delight in making us pay for it. The second lie is that God really doesn't care what we do, probably doesn't even know, and if he does, it's his business to forgive. He'll always forgive no matter what, so what we do really doesn't make any difference of what we believe. Both are lies straight from the pit of hell. God is not mean. The Bible says God is love. And He not only knows what you do, He cares. Every intimate detail. I want to close with this story. Dante Bartil Rossetti was a famous 19th century poet and artist. He was once approached by an elderly man. And the old fella had some sketches and some drawings that he wanted Rosetti to look at and tell him if they were any good to at least say, is there any potential there, if they showed any potential of talent. So Rosetti looked them over carefully, and as soon as he took the first glance at them, he knew they were absolutely worthless, showing not the least sign of artistic talent. But Rosetti was a kind man, and he told the elderly man as gently as he possibly could that, that the pictures really didn't have any value and showed little talent. He said, sir, I, I'm sorry, but, you know, I, I don't want to lie to you. And the old man was disappointed naturally, but he seemed to expect Rosetti's judgment. He then apologized for taking up Rosetti's time, but he said, would he look at just a few more drawings, these that had been done by a young art student? Rosetti looked over the second batch of sketches and immediately was enthused over the talent they revealed. Oh, he said, these are good. These are actually very, very good. He said, this young man, whoever he is, has great talent. He should be given every help and encouragement in his career as an artist. He has a great future if he'll just work and stick with it. Rosetti could see that the old man was deeply moved. He said, who is this fine young artist, your son? No, the old man said, it's actually me. 40 years ago if only I'd heard your praise then for you see I got discouraged and I gave up and I quit encouragement is perhaps one of the greatest gifts a friend or a person can ever give an encouraging friend is a lifeline to a steady floundering heart to bring sunshine to a cloudy day and to deliver a blessing to somebody else just looking for a place to land. And so I ask as we close, do you know somebody today who has a song waiting to be sung, some art waiting to be hung, a piece waiting to be played, a scene waiting to be staged, a tale waiting to be told, a book waiting to be sold, a rhyme waiting to be read, a speech waiting to be said? If you do, don't let them die with the music or the words still in them. Encourage them. Encourage them to step out, to try, to be all that God has created them to be. And that's my encouragement to each and every one of you today. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you for the gift of encouragement. And we thank you especially those for those people, Father, who are intentional encouragers, those who go out of their way to say, hey, you make a difference. Hey, I appreciate you. Hey, thank you so much for what you do. Hey, thank you for praying for me. Hey, thank you for having time to answer my question. Lord, we all need to be encouraged. And what I've discovered, Father, through following you for however many years now is that so often in the kingdom the very things that we need 
if we'll give, we in turn will receive. So let us go out of here today. I pray each and every one of us has been encouraged by the power and through the promises of your word. But let us go out with the intention of being an encourager to intentionally look for those who are sad or downtrodden or have lost hope or maybe are still afraid and encourage them. Encourage them. Father, help us, we pray. We pray and ask you these and all things in Christ's name. We want to thank you all for being here with us today and pray that you've been blessed by being here. I pray that you will go out of here with the intent of being an intentional encourager, saying, God, just give me somebody. I don't care if it's a stranger at Walmart, and I want to give them a word of encouragement. I want to encourage you again today. Please be praying, as Daryl shared. Uh, first thing, the deacon nominations. Today is the last day for that. The nomination box is right outside this door here in our welcome center. Anybody you believe, any of the, uh, that are serving or meeting the qualifications that God gives us in the book of Timothy as well as Titus, for those men to meet those qualifications that you believe are serving as well as those that are actively serving. Please be mindful, each one that are already deacons have to be renominated again. So please be in prayer about that and uh, take action today. The day is your last day to nominate. Also be praying, as Daryl said, our church council began work on nominations. It's going to have to go much faster than normal this time. So please be praying about that. You may be approached if you're already serving in a position. And in just a week or so, there will also be sheets, the nomination sheets that go up, give an opportunity where there's still areas left and still needs. So please, please be praying about all that. And with all that said, I'm going to ask Brother Tony Ratley if he'd have our benediction this morning.